The essential nature of EMS work in America has become increasingly clear since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be talking about workplace mental health with the founders of one of the top EMS leadership efforts in the nation. Up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Safety at work is more than freedom from physical injury. To be safe, you have to feel safe. Join us each week as we discuss psychologically healthy and safe work in the USA. Well, welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I'm just happy to have you tuning in today. Each week, we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experience, research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize the impact and effect of psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. According to the 2020 National EMS Assessment, there were a total of 1,030,760 licensed emergency medical services professionals that includes EMS first responders, EMTs, emergency medical technicians, and paramedics in the United States. These essential workers are a part of what I describe as the pre-hospital healthcare system. EMX, EMS practitioners face challenging and traumatic events that can, and do in many cases, have a significant effect on their mental well-being every single day. The mounting effect of patient needs, family, long work days, uh, nutrition or lack thereof, physical health, sleep deprivation, they all contribute to an individual self and to their sense of self and sense of wellness. Paramedics and EMTs responded to thousands and thousands and thousands of calls, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is when many uh, came to understand how essential these workers actually are and started to understand some of the challenges that they face. The mental and emotional health of EMS practitioners is just one of the topics that's being highlighted at the fourth EMS Leadership Summit. That summit has grown to become one of the top pre-hospital healthcare leadership training and development events in the world. And it's sponsored by the EMS Leadership Academy. Today, I have the honor and the pleasure of having not one, but both of the co-founders of the EMS Leadership Academy, Lisa Deruzzi and Robbie McHugh. A welcome, ma'am. Welcome, sir. How are uh, both of you doing? How, how's it going for you, Lisa? It's going great. I'm so uh, excited to be here and in this conversation. And I just thank you so much for having us and more importantly, for everything you're doing to um, help people in our field. It's just, it's just so needed. And I just thank you for that. Absolutely. Robbie, how about you? I, I will echo those sentiments. Uh, thrilled to be here. Any chance I get, uh, any time I get a chance to, you know, record a session with you, David, uh, we are, uh, I'm always, you know, happy to be here and to be in the conversation with you about safety. Um, and I think just people have a misconception that safety is just physical. And yes. you bring up a lot of these interesting points around the psychological impact mm -hmm. of the profession and uh, your help in advocating certainly uh, it resonates with our message and, and supporting EMS providers around the globe. So thanks again for the work you've done in this uh, in this great field. Sure, sure. You know, as I shared before, we pushed record and I do virtually each week, I feel that we're able to to learn about the guest best from the guest. So I start each of these conversations out with a question. And because there are two of you, uh, I have two questions. The first question, Lisa, who is Lisa Jerutsi? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I would say I'm not one thing. You know, I'm a, a dynamic being who's constantly evolving. And who I am right now is committed to changing the world. Actually, I've probably been that way my whole life, my whole career. But um, and with Robbie and I, what we're working on and, you know, what we're developing, we're really um, committed to 
causing a transformation in the world of leadership and in particular EMS leadership. And so who I am is um, I see myself as a leader causing other leaders to transform uh, who they are so that they can be the best possible support and caretaker for the people that they lead. And in addition to that, I'm a, a wife and uh, I uh, am a daughter. I am in full-time, pretty much full-time caretaking for my mom, who's 95 and a half. Um, I'm, uh, in addition to the EMS Leadership Academy, I own a coaching and consulting firm, and I uh, mostly work with business leaders uh, and nonprofit leaders around the world to uh, transform their organizations. And uh, same theme, you know, the, I will say one more thing and then I'll stop talking about me is I realized a long time ago the impact of the workplace. You know, I started the field in social work and I was working with families and um, uh, children and victims of domestic violence and all of that was good work. But one of the things I realized is people spend the vast majority of their time at work, thinking about work, driving home from work, working. And if the workplaces could be centers of evolution, centers of learning, centers of caring, um, what how it would change the world. So that is how I got interested in business coaching and, and organizational change. And so that's a big focus of mine is, you know, that's how you, I think we're going to transform the planet is through organizations and leaders primarily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, similar question. Who's robbing the queue? All right, David, I have to follow Lisa's. <laughs> um, but uh, I am, number one, a fan of, you know, your work and what you're doing. And I, I certainly see the link between the the psychological impact EMS providers go through on a daily basis and the work that they do um, and their well-being. So, again, I, I reiterate, I appreciate this work and this conversation. My background, I've been involved in emergency medical services since the age of 15 is a first responder. My uncle uh, kind of uh, got me into this whole industry and gave me a little peek into what's, uh, you know, what's possible and giving back to your community. My uh, background is in information technology, which sounds a little weird because I've combined it with my passion as a paramedic for going on 20 years. And um, the work we're doing with the EMS Leadership Academy, Academy and building this platform to feature great speakers. Uh, every year we feature 30 to 35 speakers at our annual EMS Leadership Summit Conference. Um, and I'm just astounded at the, the level of talent we get to highlight and how we get to share that and how we can democratize that information to reach people that normally might not be reachable. And uh, you know, EMS is provided in all areas of the world the fact that last year, um, you know, we just reached over 12,000 people um, in the last three years from 44 different countries, mainly in North America, um, but very proud that we've been able to feature speakers from other languages, other backgrounds, and uh, value diverse perspectives and give people a new perspective. It's it's the work of, you know, it's very fulfilling work when you can get people to see a new perspective. I think that's what kind of hooked me when, uh, you know, Lisa and I started working together. Her background is a great organizational coach and a performance coach. I was the leader of a nonprofit uh, ambulance service from the age of 19, thrust into a leadership position uh, with no leadership training. And that's often the mistake I think that most organizations make, um, not preparing people for a role or giving them the tools uh, in their leadership toolbox before damage can uh, is done uh, accidentally, not on purpose in most mm. cases. Um, people with the best intentions, you know, they could be the best paramedic or clinical person and they're thrust into a leadership role because they were the best at managing or do or not, they were the best at doing, not necessarily the best at leading. Um, so when Lisa, when I first met Lisa, you know, uh, we clicked and uh, her work in my organization, um, you know, we more than doubled the size of the organization by hosting a few micro trainings, I'd say, um, and getting people to see a new perspective was huge. 
and uh, you know, together, Lisa and I, with the Academy, um, we we took those successes. We published a book and sold copies around the world, from Moose Jaw, Canada, <laughs> to Ireland, uh, England, uh, Australia, all around the world. So the message resonated with folks, and and that's kind of the path and the journey we've been on, as Lisa said, to to become the source of transformational leadership, not just to give people more information, but to help them see a new perspective. If they can see their coworkers differently, their family member differently. They're going to show up as a as a better person in that workplace, uh, and they're going to and everyone's going to have a better experience. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit about who we are. <laughs> Absolutely, I I I find it interesting how you know the I, I guess serendipity might be a word that we might use, but how our paths have crossed over the previous you know few years. I, I recall, matter of fact, I, I don't recall which of it uh, which of you were the ones who reached out and said, "Hey, we're having this thing." us an ems summit or something like that we heard you somewhere or somebody recommended you and why don't you come by and i'm a sucker for a great idea i really am <laughs> and uh this was back in the days where folks are going out you know online you know how are you going to get people to fly there and and uh, <laughs> I, uh and I, I i thought at the time it just seemed like this is a pretty unique idea to have an entire conference it's all virtual and this was pre-pandemic, of course, mm -hmm. um, and I'd imagine there were some folks back back in the day, and we're only talking a few years ago, who probably thought, ah, that'll never go anywhere. And lo and behold, lo and behold, a year later, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and it seems like it's just a brilliant idea. Brilliant yeah. idea. Yeah, they yeah. thought we were crazy. We had people that said, ah, I don't know about this virtual thing. We really like to meet people in person. Right. And, you know, we ran with it. And we had people that were early adopters like yourself that, you know, they dove in and they were willing to to take a little risk. And and boy, it's been a great journey. And getting to, again, meet all these great experts and feature them uh, around the world has been an honor. And Absolutely. you know what's interesting? And, and we often don't talk about, uh, I don't think we talk about this very much, but early in the pandemic, Robbie and I were planning our next summit and we somehow before the pandemic even was declared because it was January of 2020 Robbie and I started doing started talking about doing just a, a mini summit we had had success in 2019 we expect we were hoping for 200 people in 2019 we got 1500 on day one wow. we were floored so then we're all excited we're getting ready for 2020 this is before we know the world's going to go nuts, right? And we see all this kind of stuff and we're talking and we go, hey, let's do a two day focused uh, program, uh, just a two day summit on uh, safety. And we did one day of physical safety and the next day on psychological safety. This was in May of 2020. And, and it was, we had all the stuff recorded ahead of time. And, you know, we saw that coming and we, I don't even know how, I don't know if you remember Robbie, how we knew how, but we just, we were committed to the idea. And then we did the summit in 2020 and we had, I don't know, five, what was it? 4,000 people, 30, something like that in 2020. Cause there was, no, you know, there was no other game in town and people are like, you already have all the infrastructure. But anyway, I could talk about the summit forever and ever, but. It's just interesting because we don't often talk about the two-day summit, which you were a part of, David. Sure. Um, and but that was that was early on, and it Absolutely. was in this very topic of psychological safety and physical safety. So that 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 leads to a a, a great uh, kind of specific question around uh, the conversations that I have with folks. So if I were to ask both of you, and Lisa, I'll ask you first. What what does psychological health and safety mean to you? What 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 thoughts are conjured when I say psychological health and safety? Well, it's certainly uh, changed over the years, and not in you know in no small part due to our relationship and what I've learned from you and and other articles that I've read. But one of the things I would say is, and this may sound a little strange, but I work with people on their relationship to their thinking. And so for me, psychological safety or psychological health, let me start there. Psychological health for me is when someone has a relationship to their thinking of skepticism. <laughs> In other words, they don't believe everything they think, right? They don't 
they see their thinking for what it is, a past-based uh, assessment and interpretation of what's happening in the present. That's all thinking ever is. It's the past. It's always the past. It's all the brain has access to. So that for me is when someone has a healthy skepticism of their thinking, right, and they can see that it's one possible way of seeing the world, that that opens people up to interacting with what's happening in reality without all the filters of their opinions and past-based assessments and the what I like to call the distortion of the thinking goggles, right, or the mood goggles that we look at life through. Now, that being said, psychological safety is for me, when I have that health, that ability to see my thinking for what it is, and I'm able to express myself and my opinions, understanding their one possible point of view, but in a way that is uh, uh, okay. In other words, I don't have to bite my tongue. I don't have to walk on eggshells. I don't have to uh, worry about retribution. I don't have to worry that people are going to say one thing to me and then talk about me behind my back. Like there's a, there's a, a, a an environment that allows for all of me to show up the good, the bad, the ugly, and understand that everyone else has that too. Right. I'm going to do my best to mitigate the ugly <laughs> and do my best to, you know, uh, work on, uh, or, or to evolve the bad. Right. But in overall that, that I'm accepted and appreciated, uh, not me, but one is. And, and I would say that, I mean, you know, there's obviously more to it than that, but that's what first comes to mind is that I have my own uh, understanding of my own thinking, which gives me an ability to then be in the present moment in conversation with other people and see that my opinions and my uh, assessments and all of that is not the truth. It's one way of looking at it which then allows other people to have a psychologically safe experience with me, mm. right? So the more I think people understand that, and, you know, it's an innocent misunderstanding that people have about their thinking, the, the more possible psychological safety becomes. Sure, sure. Robbie, what, what, are, what are your thoughts regarding just what the concept itself? What, what do you think? Um, the concept itself, I think, is so powerful <clears throat> if we can help leaders have more awareness that, that Lisa's pointing to, right? We can have them have more self-awareness about the impact they have on people and the ripple effect it has in an organization. Because there's this underlying culture that gets created when a manager or a, a supervisor or a leader does something, the way they react instead of respond. Um, I think there there's such powerful nuances in the behaviors that leaders can be aware of and I'm a huge fan. The more tools we can help leaders put in their toolbox, and especially the tool of psychological safety. I first heard Amy Edmondson talk about this, um, and I became an immediate fan. And I think it might have been Amy's TED Talk or her her book, um, where she kind of opens with a story of the NICU or PICU nurse. Uh, it's you know two o'clock in the morning, and she's caring for a patient and. And she's looking through the orders of what medications that the doctor prescribed. And, and she notices a medication uh, just doesn't look right. And immediately her brain unconsciously like flashes back to the moment where the, the last time she brought this up to a doctor, she was berated and, you know, told, you know, why would you question me? And of course this is right. And the way that doctor handled the situation was, was she had a flashback immediately. And she questioned, you know, you know, do I want that experience again? Or, you know what, should I just do uh, what the doctor said? And at two o'clock in the morning, she didn't want to wake that doctor up. She didn't want to have that experience again. All happening in a second, I think, unconsciously. And it led her to just follow the orders like she was told the last time because she was called out, like she was stupid, like she didn't know what she was talking about. And it just devalues people. And thankfully, there was nothing critical that happened with the medication error, but it was also, with the comfort level, did she feel comfortable realizing afterwards that this was a, a medication error and a mistake? Did she feel comfortable enough admitting the mistake? So I think these are all great things that can tie back into the psychological safety that we're creating, taking the responsibility for the environment that's created in our organizations. Oh, that's so good, Robbie. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that if, if people think about 
the healthcare system in general, at least my understanding of the healthcare system, is that one of the major causes of death in the system is human error. And it's it's interesting to me that we've somehow created these systems and don't assume that humans err. It and I, I struggle, I struggle often with the concept of mistake, because who says it's a mistake? If the person is using all the information they have available to them at the time and making the decision based on the information they have at the time, is it a mistake? It's not to you know, to to dig into that about, you know, ethics and, you know, beliefs and all that type of thing. But I, 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 I'm not convinced that all of these are mistakes. I do believe that they are errors, uh, but I do believe that the average person is doing what they believe to be the right thing at the time with the information that they have. Yes. And, and, and given the conversation we're having about having about psychological health and safety in general, and Robbie, I want to start with you on this one. What is your assessment of the state of psychological health and safety in the EMS industry today? I would say for the most part, it's missing. I would say that we we have a lot of great leaders pointing to the aviation industry and how they've really tried to adopt this idea of just culture and this idea of safety. And at the same time, as many people as have heard talk about this, I just don't see the boots on the ground. I don't see the organizations following suit um, the book I pointed to, Amy Evans's book, was uh, The Fearless Organization was one of them. And I think it, it's it's interesting to, to talk about, you know, performance. And when they looked at high performing teams versus the low performing teams, they wanted to look at error rates and reporting and how and how what was the error rate of this high performing organization? What was this error rate of a low performing team? And when they did the research, um, she actually, when she did the research, she found she was a little bit baffled at first and said, well, why does this, why does this high performing team have such a high error rate? And you've got this, these low performers, they've got virtually no errors. That seems very counterintuitive. And when she started to do the interviews and ask the questions and, and drop her assumptions, which I think is, is so critical that a lot of the work Lisa and I talk about is dropping your assumptions of what you think is true and being willing and open to hearing other perspectives, she found that the low performing team, the one that was kind of tasked or labeled the low performers, they had no error rates because nobody felt comfortable to report the errors. The high performers felt psychologically safe. They felt comfortable enough to bring up their mistakes, to talk about it because they can only learn from it moving forward. And I thought that was such an interesting kind of um, point <clears throat> that, that Amy talks about in, in that book about psychological safety. And I just hope that organizations and leaders get on a mission to to want that for their organizations, to want their providers to feel safe enough to bring up and talk about their mistakes. Nobody's perfect. We're all learning. <clears throat> We're all human. You know, I've been in this industry for over 20 years. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I don't I don't go around claiming to be some clinical expert. I love learning about leadership. I love learning about topics like this that are going to empower our leaders to create a better organization for the future. And if people can feel comfortable talking about their mistakes, they can learn from each other. We're going to have better outcomes for the industry. Absolutely. Lisa, what's your assessment of psychological health and safety across the EMS industry? Um, well, I would say that it's, uh, I don't know what danger is that, is that on the scale? Um, it, you know, only because, you know, I even hear the leaders that come to our organization, um, our training say things like, we have to stop eating our young. I mean, those are the phrase they're using. And I'm like, mm -hmm. say more about that. What does that mean? And they're like, oh, well, you know, trial by fire. And, you know, they want to make sure that they're tough enough and make it. And I'm like, what is happening? Like, dude, did you like that when that was <laughs> happening to you? And they're like, no, but you know, then why, why, why would you do that? You know? And again, I'm, I, I don't know, cause I'm not in every organization, but we hear from people all around the world. We, we, you know, get communications from people all around the world and, and, you know, over and over and over, we hear about this revolving door syndrome, right? Of people getting recruited and coming in and seeing nothing they were thought was going to happen is actually happening. You know that they're that they're not valued. You know, um, leaders will say things like, "Well, we want engaged, high-performing 
people, but then when they come in and they're engaged, high performing people, they push them back. You, we don't do it that way. That's not the way we tried that. Uh, the problem with that idea is right. Like all these moments. And for me, that's where psychological safety lives. It's not in some highfalutin, you know, policies and procedures. Yes, those are necessary, but it's in the moment by moment interactions that you're having with people that, that are creating either a, a safe environment or a dangerous environment, a, you know, a toxic culture or a healthy culture. And, you know, these flippant remarks that people make, these, uh, you know, things that I, I would consider bullying. I mean, you and I, David, uh, did an interview about bullying and, and workplace violence, you know, that's seen as, oh, no, that's just that's just razzing each other, you know, or that we're and all of those kinds of things that that I think are in the fabric of EMS need to get brought out in the open and and realize that that's why we have a recruitment and retention problem. Mm. It's not because young people this and pay is that and we think people should get paid boatloads of money to do this work. Okay, so I'm not saying don't pay and give benefits. But when you look at what people in EMS want, money is not the top on the list, right? They want to make a difference. They want to feel important. They want to be cared for. They want to have a uh, uh, the ability, yes, they do want the ability to feed themselves, right? And pay their bills without having to work five jobs, right? So, you know, for me, I think the state of, is, is scary. And I think that we're at a crossroads. And I think that this conversation that you're having and that we're starting to see more and more, and the, the reason that we're focusing on this so much more, this summit than others, is because it's, it, it's going to be, for me, it's going to be... Yeah, whether or not we have a sustainable EMS system or not is going to depend on this psychological safety uh, and physical safety yeah. of, of how organizations take care of their providers and stop treating people like seats, you know, meet in seats and start treating them like 360 degree people, like whole people that uh, deserve to be just because they're human. That's the only reason any of us deserve to be treated well, right? Just because we were born. Everyone deserves to be treated well. And uh, and I think that's the wake-up call that's happening right now. And I think, you know, again, I've never ridden an ambulance, so I want to be responsible for that. I was trained as an EMT many, many years ago. I served in a, a non-medical detox, and I uh, was a child protective worker, so I had those uh, the training. But I've never, I've never ridden an ambulance, so I don't know. But what I will say is that you know, what I hear from providers, they just want to be treated well. They just want to, they, they're not asking for limos, you know. Right. <laughs> they're not asking for applause every time they walk in. But how about let's not call each other names? Mm. How about we don't, how about we ask you, you know, what do you need? And then provide it. How about that? Is yeah. it any easier or simpler than that? I mean, I think that's so well said and, and, and reiterating, nobody wants to feel like a piece in a machine either. Um, we have, as leaders, we create budgets. We include budget line items for ambulance replacement, repairs, vehicle replacement, equipment repairs, stretchers. Yet where is our budget line item for people and the people maintenance too? Where is our, you know, and don't tell me it's the paycheck. Um, you know, I once had somebody tell me like, you know, I don't need to say thank you every two weeks we're even. And I thought that was like one of the worst things I could, could possibly hear from a leader from a, really a manager, not a leader, um, to, to not value your people. And I think it's just a mistake that that managers get into and leaders get into. Managers should be managing things, not people. They should be leading people, right? right. They're leaders with management responsibilities. And often I don't think they're clear about, about that and the impact that they have on other people. Um, the ripple effect, Lisa points to this toxic culture concept uh, for, 20, 30, 40 years they've been talking about recruitment and retention. <laughs> it's the symptom. And what we talk about is going upstream. Find that what's causing these symptoms. If we can fix it upstream, then we don't have to deal with the 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 end results. Right. Lisa Lisa's also mentioned the idea of, you know, this is this system is designed a certain way to produce a result. It's like exhaust to a combustion engine. <laughs> mm. Like we don't just cut off the exhaust and we'll we'll stall out the engine. You have to create an electric car or electric vehicle 
that has no emissions if you want that result. So I think there's a lot of great things to talk about here when we when we get into like this idea of toxic cultures. It's started by toxic leaders and it's this downward spiral that we that we see the result of. Yeah, I I having ridden on an ambulance a handful of times and uh and, and I I get into homerism when I talk about this because I came up in the Seattle King County Medic One system, which I still believe is the best EMS system in the world. But uh, in terms of providing service to the public, it's great. The psychological and psychosocial hazards that I was exposed to was a whole different story altogether that we didn't talk about. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't talk about that at all. It was just understood that the if you went into the paramedic program, you had a 75 to 80 percent chance of being divorced. You know, if you uh, if you rode on certain units around the city that you knew, you knew that by the time the person got to the end of their career, they're likely going to have, you know, some type of, you know, substance abuse challenge or it, it, it was just kind of the way things were. And it is so really wonderful when I think about the the state of this conversation in the industry. It's I'm of two minds. It's both horrible and wonderful at the same time. It's horrible that we're this far down the line and just having this conversation, but it's wonderful that we're actually having one at all. Yeah. Because for many years, there was no conversation. It's simply, you get in the rig, you go, we, you do what we tell you. Uh, we we send you over here, send you over there. You're simply, you simply are a, a piece of meat in the seat. And uh, it is wonderful to have opportunities for folks to see that you could do something different. So when we talk about this topic, uh, and again, Dr. Edmondson's work comes up so often and it's so important that folks understand the importance of a system that allows everyone to bring their whole selves and to not have to worry so much about how the system is gonna treat them. But when I talk about it from a safety perspective, so a psychosocial hazard is a hazard that's perceived or experienced by the person. At least it gets back to the point that you made. These small, what people might think are, you know, almost offhand comments or discussions that don't even seem to be that big of a deal, they affect people in certain ways. And we're only going to know if they are affected by having an environment where people actually will speak up. Because it's going on, it's affecting people, but, um, are they actually bringing it up? And, I, and I, there's a so there's some research. Uh, there's a document that I use in my research, actually, that I, I provide to folks. And uh, I, I wanted to have, you know, really both of you kind of share a little bit about a circumstance that you can think about. And this doesn't necessarily have to be directly to EMS. But can you think about a circumstance where either you or some or you observe someone being exposed to something that you believe is a psychosocial hazard that really wasn't handled well and what how should it have been handled? How should it have been handled? And, and Robbie, in this case, again, I'll start with you. Uh, some Either yourself or someone else, you saw it or you experienced it. It went one way, but it should have gone another. Unfortunately, I see it a lot. I would I would say I, I'm remembering back to a, an interview and a guest we we had on the summit, uh, Liz Crow. She's an advanced social worker down in uh, in Australia, and she's a clinical social worker. And her research was around the incivility in the workplace. And when she said that word, I just finally had some language to describe the things I've seen over the years, and not just knowing how to put language to it. Um, it's so funny. The more I learn, the more I realize I have no idea. I, I, have, I have so much more to learn every time I learn something new. And so she really pointed to things I've seen over the years of this incivility in the workplace. And I, I think for the most part, it's done in those heated moments. It's not done intentionally. And I think it's just those people that are not self-aware enough. Um, they don't have the emotional intelligence to understand the way that they come across to people. And it goes back to their lack of leadership development and skills. If they had more tools in their toolbox of how to deal with people, they would have more so emotional self-control. They wouldn't fly off the deep end. They wouldn't say something that they regretted later. And unfortunately, it's people that grew up with the the mantra, well, you know, my boss treated me this way, so it must be okay. And, you know, I've witnessed it so many times. David, I, I mean, we have to point to your survey, uh, the psychological hazard inventory. When I took that, uh, I went through all the questions and 
and I was just shocked by the, the time I got to the end because it was exposed chronically, exposed uh, chronic. Yeah, every almost every answer I felt was like just this chronic exposure to um, these psychosocial hazards cool. that I didn't have language to 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 really identify before. Lucy, your thoughts? Well, I'm going to give you an example, but I want to. I would like to say one other thing first, if that's okay, and that is sure. that. Um, I think the thing that is really essential is to see the paradigm shift that needs to happen for this to to really have a tipping point and uh, be a different world, not just in EMS, but in the workplace. I think, you know, we're seeing retention and recruitment issues everywhere uh, now in, in organizations. Um, I shouldn't say everywhere, but in a, a lot of places. And you know, again, people are making it about the, the economy and money and all those things. And I would encourage people, and I, I'd like people to consider that this is this is going upstream. Okay, that's what Robbie was referring to. There's a paradigm shift here. There, are, organizations were designed initially to be machines, essentially, and people were parts in that machine. So getting a job was a privilege. Think back in our history, right? Being able to get a job was a privilege. So you did whatever it took to keep that job. You worked hours, you, you know, you, you did all kinds of stuff, right? To keep the job because the organization was king and you were a pawn in that game, right? Well, smart people that we are as humans, we raised our kids to want more, right? They, we, our kids saw, and I don't have kids, but I mean, the next generation and the next generation, and the next generation, we raised our children to want more, to want better lives, to have better lives, not just want better lives, but have better lives. People sacrifice themselves as parents so their kids had better lives. So the kids start asking for more. They grow up and they go, huh, I'm not going to give 40 years of my life for a freaking watch. No, thank you. Right. And then the people in the other generation are like, those ungrateful brats. But it's like, no, no. We raised them <laughs> to want and have a better life. So fast forward, here we are in this generation. The last two generations really are uh, not just parts in a machine. They're not going to settle for that. They're just we raised them that way, right? They want more. They want their human beings. They're all about uh, not to generalize, but they want to make a difference. They want to contribute. They are. Uh, such a different way of thinking, right? And, and so organizations now need to think in terms of how do we create ourselves? How do we design ourselves to serve the individuals, to serve human being? And that will be the new, I think, the new paradigm. And that's what I think we're seeing. I think we're on the, the you know, the break of that. And, and it's going to take up giving up a lot of thinking. So I'm going to give you an example that speaks to that. So many years ago, when I, uh, before I had my own company, I worked for, uh, we'll call it a government agency. And it was, and I was on the labor management. I was labor, I was a union person. And we had what we thought was a simple issue. We were moved to a, a new building. Uh, we were the only, we were primarily women. We were the only office on the floor. Everything else was still under construction. And the ladies' room did not have a lock on the door. So, so the, each stall did, but the ladies' room didn't. And many of the women came to us and they said, we don't feel safe. And we've asked to have a lock installed. No one, and they're like, no, we're not doing that. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this an issue? <laughs> it's a five minute fix. It's a, I'll buy the damn lock. Like, why is this a problem? So it ended up going to the labor management. So I'm on the labor side. So I, I'm incredulous. I'm like, I'm thinking there's just a miscommunication. This can't be a... Well, when I tell you the pushback that we got, that we were being babies, you, there's construction workers. These are women. We're the only women in the building. What the hell is the problem? It's a, it's a lock. <laughs> it's not like, and everybody's going to have a key. You know what I mean? It's not like... They pushed back and fun. I kept asking questions because that's who I am. And finally, 
finally, they just didn't want us to have our way. They didn't, they thought if they gave into this, that they were going to have to give into other things. So they were fight. So do you see what I'm saying? Where it's like, you work for us. Now, these were also women, by the way, it wasn't like, you know, but once people got into that leadership role, and I don't even like to call them leaders, but, you know, management managers, right? They were considered the leaders of the organization. It was like a switch went off. It was a whole new paradigm, a different way of thinking. A year ago, they were, would have been all about, let's get the lock. But a year, a year later, they're in this position and the, and the, the water that they're swimming in is, we have to be top. We have to toe the line. We can't give in to what people need, what people are asking for. And it was palpable. Mm. And I think that isn't, I mean, this was not EMS. I think this is, again, the water that people have, have swum in, is that the right term? Have been swimming in. Um, the conditioning that we've all had from when we are born about what does it mean to be a boss? What does it mean to be an organization? What does it mean to be an employee? That paradigm has shifted at the bottom, so to speak, or at the entry level, because we raise different humans, <laughs> right? But it hasn't yet, the conditioning is still strong and the goggles that people are wearing in the higher up levels, you know, from middle managers up, is I gotta be tough. I gotta have. I can't give in. You know. I have to. I have to keep my people in check. You know. And that's what I think. That's one woman's opinion about what's happening and what what needs to shift. And I think that's the work that Robbie and I are doing in EMS. That's the work my company is doing, is helping people to see the water they're swimming in. Because when they see it, they go, Well, this doesn't even make sense. Right. But they don't see it. And that goes back to what Robbie was saying about not being aware. And it's innocent. You know, I, none of these people were jerks. They were, my, we used to hang out, the people on management. So it wasn't like, oh, it was this, us and them. It was just us and them in that room when we needed a stupid lock, which we had, by the way, got. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The, uh, <laughs> it is interesting, the, the conditioning that goes on in organizations regardless to whether they are, uh, particularly from an EMS perspective, public or private. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. In, uh, in the fire rescue service, there's this conversation about the difference between volunteers and career. And it's the same. I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the water that folks are swimming in is still essentially the same thing. And whether or not they're compensated is actually irrelevant. And it goes back to one of the points that both of you continue to make, and I, and I want to drill down a little bit further is to talk about the role of the leader in creating this psychologically safe and healthy environment. And I'm, I'm not convinced that it is possible to maintain it. I think you can establish it without people. A group of people can get together and amongst them, they can decide, here's how we're gonna work together and chat with each other and talk to each other and treat each other. But if there's not someone in leadership who believes that this is important, even if you start it, it, it'll, it'll be destroyed. And I, so I, I want you to both talk a little bit about, Lisa, why don't you talk a little bit first about, you know, and again, connect that to this, you know, the Leadership Academy, what's, what's the role of leaders in causing all this to happen? I don't think it happens without them. You know, I mean, I think everyone could think about, you know, a mission statement being on the wall, it's all beautiful and our people are our strongest assets and we value our people. And then the experience from their leader is you're, you know, the dirt on the bottom of my shoe and please pay attention to what I'm saying and do what I tell you. You know, and you say, oh, but I have an idea. And they go, yeah, good for you. Tell your story, walk in, do what I tell you, right? Wait, wait, we have a mission statement. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> what is happening? Like there's this huge disconnect, right? So I think without uh, leaders, and again, I'm going to keep pointing to, this is a moment by moment by moment experience. And I, I'm going to talk a minute about outside of EMS, because in our very first summit, we had a, a presentation by Tom Amell, who was CEO of a local bank here where we live. And he took over this very successful bank, but it was very stodgy again this is my opinion uh it was a 
old traditional bank. And he told him when he came in, he said, look, if you hire me as a CEO, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put employee engagement as the center of our business model. Everything we do is to serve our employees. When you have employees who are taken care of in that way, they will create uh, advocate, uh, avid customers, like just people who want to be uh, a part of this organization and will t bring other people and that will lead to financial success. So they told him, okay, you have, I think I gave him two years, show us. He doubled the bank size in three years from a half a billion to a billion. Because, and that's all he does. And he talk about walking the talk. I mean, if anybody wants to see that video, we will gladly provide the link because he, everything they do, everything is first looked at through the lens of, does this serve our employees? Does it engage our employees? How does it take care of our people? When they built their new um, building, everything, every decision, the board and the executive team looks at through that lens. He has 40 to 50 applicants for tellers because people want to be a part of that organization so badly. They will come in as tell. He says he has the most highly qualified tellers of any bank <laughs> in the area. People with degrees that because they know to get in that bank means that they're going to get trained. They have a lead. They have a, a leadership academy. Anyone can be a part of not. You don't have to have a title. As a matter of fact, they prefer that you go through it. Like Robbie said, train them first. Right. That was one man with a vision. And for us, that's what we that's what defines a leader in our and I don't mean to speak for Robbie, but I think I can in this instance is a leader is someone who brings something into existence that wasn't going to happen anyway. Hmm. They have a vision and they they don't know how to do it, but they know how to bring people together and enroll people in that vision and create something that wasn't going to happen anyway. And that's what that's what Tom did, and that's what we have seen leaders do in our industry. That's why we showcase. We're we're not speaking for 30 hours on our summits, right? We bring other leaders into our summits who are doing what you know, who are aligned with what we see. We're we're not bringing people in who are doing something else, right? Right. Right. <laughs> we're not having people come in and say, "Hey, here's how you treat your people like children and demoralize them." We don't have those speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to see that. Um, but my point is, is that, you know, I think and 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 my experience has been and again, I've been a coach, business coach for over uh, 20 years. Um, this is what works. This is what creates, you know, psychologically safe organizations that people want to be a part of. And I promise you, you know, Tom's not worried about recruitment and retention. He's worried about fulfilling his, he's not even worried about it. He knows he's on a, he's going to fulfill the vision. And, um, and he's not, he doesn't have a piece of paper on the wall that says we're a great bank. It's a lived experience. Sure. He says on Monday mornings or any morning he gets on the elevator, he's, he's this, he is the leader of the organization. It's not only when he's in a meeting, when he interacts with every single employee, every single customer, he embodies the vision of the organization. Absolutely. And that's what it takes. And it's it's simple. It's not necessarily easy, but it's really simple. Robbie, to be great with people. R Robbie, your, your your thoughts about the ro the critical role of leaders in this conversation. Well, I think at the academy we we often say leadership can happen at any level. It's not a position. And certainly it's easier if you have people in a leadership position that that say, we're all in, we want to do this. <laughs> we're, we're an open book. Tell us that that's great. We love those organizations. And, you know, I think back to some of our some of the my early earlier successes in working with Lisa and, and the organization I was the uh, the president of. We got we didn't just do communication trainings. The next level was getting current and future leaders together and creating a vision for the future. And our work is based on appreciative inquiry, David Cooper writer's work, and you know the idea of uh, strengths-based focus instead of a deficit-based approach, which I think differentiates our work. And it was asking the question, you know, if you can wave a magic wand five years from now, you could have anything be the way the future be any, any possible way, what would you want? And people are a little bit like, you know, staring deer in the headlights. 
Because when you ask people about connection, they'll tell you about disconnection. When you ask people about, you know, their great experiences of a boss, they'll tell you every experience of a terrible boss. <laughs> so it's so challenging to get people in the in the mode of what do I really want? And uh, what do we want more of? And when we created that vision of the future, it was so magnetic. It was written in a in we we first drew it out in pictures, and they drew pictures of an abundance of people and and paid and volunteer staff uh, getting along, um, an abundance of of resources and equipment, and fully supported by the municipality. After that session, I I continued to bring our board of directors back to you know if we're going to make this decision, we're going to make it on who we said we're going to be. That, that leader, that future vision statement. Within 18 months, 95% of that came true. We doubled the municipal funding from, from the municipality. We had their support. We had an abundance of people coming from two counties away to be part of that organization because people wanted to be a part of it. People were calling up saying, what's in your water over there? What are you guys doing? Um, we had a complete building renovation project finished in a year and a half that won an award by the Historical Society, which you know, when has a building ever won an award after it gets renovated right. by the historical society? That's how bad the building looked. Right. And I feel like this is a chronic, you know, issue and mistake. And it's a symptom of our of our industry. You know, we're doing we have organizations that are so busy. They're so lacking, so resource depleted and lacking in leadership capacity, management capacity, span of control. And most municipalities aren't even funding EMS systems because they don't have to. It's not an essential service. They, um, they're resource depleted and they're just trying to hold the ship together. So as Lisa said, it's, you know, it's not done on purpose. It's an innocent misunderstanding that leaders have. They're just trying to, they're doing the best that they can do. And again, if we can bring more awareness, if we can bring more tools to that leader's toolbox and help them from their position of leadership, create a vision of the future that's so magnetic, it draws people in and mm -hmm. people want to be a part of, you know, that's exciting. That's what we love to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's when people go, when people go through the training and they go through that exercise, they realize the environment that was created and what it's like, no wonder why leadership, nobody wants to step up to be like a leader. We've had people draw pictures, the most vivid pictures when we ask them to draw, what does leadership look like in your organization? They've drawn, um, People, stick figures on a tightrope, blindfolded, walking across daggers, people <laughs> getting squeezed to death between their board and their frontline workers. Wow. Um, the most like somebody trying to juggle balls and all the balls are on the ground and the circus tents on fire behind them. <laughs> Those are the that's the picture they're painting for people. And they wonder why nobody wants to step up and lead. And then when we have them, you know, draw that vision of the future, what do they really want? Who do they want to be? They draw the most vivid pictures of a conductor of an orchestra where everyone's doing their part. The the captain of a smooth sailing ship on calm seas, um, the people, multiple people drug, juggling balls and there's nothing on the ground. Um, so it's just it's just fascinating to watch when you can get people unstuck from their their chronic thoughts about, you know, the way it's always been and trying to fix things and problem solvers versus people asking people, what do you want more of? What do you want to create? It's just a whole nother world. And it's a whole new, I think, opportunity for leaders to to create an organization that's not based on the past. It's based on what they want to create. David, can I just add one quick thing? Sure, go ahead. Robbie just did such a great job of describing your work. I, 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 I just want to add one little thing, which is, you know, People know what they need and want, but what we, we're not paying attention to is how the brain works, right? Most people in this psychologically unsafe world, right, are in the amygdala most of the time, right? They're in fight or flight mode, which is not where we think well, right? No one does better in fight or flight on tasks, right? No one does better on uh, in producing or it, it under stress. It's, it's just not done. I mean, study after study shows that. But when you ask questions like what Robbie was talking about, how we ask people, what do you want more of? You know, if you could, if you could create anything, if, if, if anything were possible, what would you want? That shifts people from their amygdala into their prefrontal cortex, which is the ho most highest evolved part of the brain, but also the creativity part. So people start to imagine, they start to see. Now, once that gets lit up, once that gets engaged, 
it doesn't stop. And, and one of the things that I, I, I was just sharing this on one of the um, interviews I was doing with uh, Michael Neal, what, what, it was 18 months between the time all, most everything got created, what Robbie's talking about, but there was an interim meeting that we had in there. I, I offered to come back because we didn't have a lot of um, attendance at this one meeting. And I just felt bad. I was like, this work isn't done, even though our contract was over. Do you remember this, Robbie? And I was like, I'd like to do one more session. And he was like, of course, you know, he's not going to turn me down, right? It's like, no charge. I just want to come in. It was about four months, maybe five months from the time we created the vision and people put all those pictures up. And I came in ready to help them design, backwards plan and design how to get those things, right? That's what I come in ready to do because I haven't seen them in four months. I get there and they're, I put all these things up and he's, they're like, oh no, we did that already. We, we did, oh, we did that already. And I was like, what do you mean? Like most of the stuff that we had talked about, they had already done, why? Because they were creating and they continue to create because that got unleashed in a group of people. And, you know, the quote by Margaret Mead, right? It's never doubt that a small group of committed people uh, can change the world because that's the only thing that ever has. And I, and I want to say that because it's so easy to look at the issues of EMS or organizations and see them like, oh, oh well, <laughs> what are you going to do? Right. You know, talk about feeling psychologically unsafe, like, ugh. But if you think about it as one person making different decisions, right? shifting their paradigm, then two people, then three people. Now you have an organization that starts to alter. And that's all, that's really what it takes. You know, Robbie was one person in his organization. He, he wanted it to be different. And then we started working together. Other people were like, huh, this is cool. I want to be a part of this. So. So absolutely. I, I, uh, what I'd like to do in our last, few moments here is have each of you uh, give me your elevator speech for folks. So there are folks probably in EMS organizations right now that have been so embroiled in what's going on today that and they've they've not seen this. They don't, you know, they, they've they've seen the other thing. They've seen the challenges, they've seen the resource limitations and they're faced with that day after day after day. And so let's just imagine you're getting into the elevator with this individual and have the opportunity to share uh, what you see happening in the EMS Leadership Academy and, and, and the summit and the work that you all are doing and just want to plant the seed about what's possible. So you've got, you know, you're going to start the first floor. You're going to get to the 10th or 12th floor at best. So uh, elevator speech time. Uh, so Lisa, what's that elevator speech about? something that's possible that that you can leave with uh, the folks who are listening today about again what's possible in terms of psychologically safe ems organizations well i would say that in every organization there's things that work and things that don't work and we spend the vast majority of our time on the things that don't work and if we look for what's working we will see it and once you see something working you can then dive in and say why is that working What's true about that situation? What are the elements that are leading to that success? That's fundamentally what appreciative inquiry is, is it's the study of what's working when an organization is operating at its best. You could also say it's true about individuals, but if I was talking to an EMS leader, I would that would be my first thing is just look, just have eyes for, just start to pay attention to the things that are working around you. What are some of the things that are working? And then get curious as to pre pretend you don't know why and start to get curious and find out what are the essential elements. And if you see what they are, where else could you apply that? Where else? And rather than looking for, you know, the broken stuff, which we see in CNC, look for what's working and you'll be amazed and inspired. And that's all it takes to get moving in a different direction. Robbie? Oh, that was good. Um, follow that up. I think it would be more along the lines of, you know, hold the line, right? You're you you've been embroiled in this pandemic and create and all the stress and pressure of your organization. And and yes, you could point to every reason why it's not working, and you can point to 
um, you know, why your boss doesn't have your back and the, the problems and the challenges. Um, and even to those folks that might not be in a leadership position, give it, give it a few years and you're going to be in a position of leadership to cause the change that you want to cause. It can happen at any level and every level for sure. And you can really be the change that, that ignites that passion in other people. And at the same time, you're probably going to be in a position of leadership if you do stick this out um, to to make those decisions and make a commitment to being the type of leader that people want to follow, being the being inspired by, you know, think back to your your best recollections of a leader in your life. What was it about them? What did you most appreciate? Focus on that, because it's probably something that that you unconsciously appreciate about uh, a, a strength of yours that you can bring out. Um, and, and develop in yourself and, and develop in others. Absolutely. I really believe that we could do a few hours of conversation amongst the three of us. I absolutely believe that. Uh, however, uh, I, I, I don't uh, I don't want to fill the airwaves too full at this uh, one setting. And uh, so just before we go, I wanted to have each of you again share a little bit about what's coming up next. What's next for you and what's next for the Academy and the work that you're doing. So, uh, Robbie, in this case, why don't we start with you? Sure. Thank you, David. And um, next week, if you're listening to this live, we are going to be launching the fourth annual EMS Leadership Summit. So you can go to emsleadershipsummit.com register for free and get access to these great sessions of, of you know various leaders talking about how do you advocate, innovate, and inspire for the future? And that's our theme. That's our through line for the year. And I'm very excited to be bringing together, you know, David, you're one of our featured speakers, to be bringing together over 30 different speakers from around the world that are focused on creating change in, in the MS industry and, and inspiring others. Okay. Lisa. What's next? Well, uh, the other thing we're doing uh, following the summit is we have created a program called EMS Leadership Live. Um, and what that is, is uh, it's actually virtual training. So uh, the attendees are virtual, but Robbie and I are in a studio. We launched it the first time in February, very successfully. I think we had 55 people from around the world, mostly um, North America, but we had uh, a couple people from Belize, which was fun, and other, a couple other countries. Um, and what we learned a lot from doing that three-day training, and we're going to be doing another one in November. And, um, and then subsequent to that, for people who want more, uh, we're going to be offering our classes um, in a new way. So rather than organizations having to bring us in, which can be very expensive um, in a time when people just don't have the funds, we are going to leverage uh, Robbie's expertise in uh, technology and people's acceptance of technology by doing um, a, a year long uh, program for leaders. And uh, we'll be launching that uh, either at, at December or January of uh, January 2023. So it'll be a year long prop pro yeah. Never know I speak for a living. A year long <laughs> training program for future leaders and current leaders to um and it'll be uh, you know affordable for organizations because they don't have to send people out, you know, travel and all of that. So we're very excited to be to be fully on going online um over the next year. And and I'd like to just add that you know it's People say, oh, virtual training, I want in person. And, you know, it's not about the virtual versus the in-person. It's about, you know, is it a crappy training or not? Because, <laughs> right. right. you know, we can give people a front row seat and talk with them live, answer their questions, provide coaching without the hassles of travel and, and bringing us in. And if you did pay the money that we charge to bring us in for just a few days, you've got a momentary impact. And we know that will have a big impact and ripple effect on the future of your organization. And at the same time, for the same price, you can get your whole leadership team access for an entire year worth of our accelerator program, our training on leadership, answer your questions. And for the same amount, you could have your whole leadership trained, your leadership team trained, for a year and that's the power of leveraging technology and leveraging live training uh live virtual training is what i'm talking about so yeah. absolutely well and thanks if you save one person from leaving your organization uh you, you know you've 
re yeah it's paid for itself and, it's and worth that's it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's worth it. We're it's very it. excited about that. And post summit, you know, you'll be hearing a lot more about that. And, and if you're interested, uh, I would have people sign up uh, for our newsletter or um, our email list because that will, you know, give you access to all of the programs that we're doing. All right, we're at emsleadershipacademy.com or anywhere on social at nine one one leadership. Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks very much. That was going to be my next uh, request is for you to share the ways that people can stay in contact with you. And uh, you're all over the place, all over the place. Uh, 911 Leadership, BMS Leadership Academy, look for Robbie, look for Lisa, uh, look look for me as well uh, out there on social media. And uh, I, I really just have enjoyed having the opportunity to, to spend some time with both of you. Uh, again, it's been an honor, it continues to be an honor of uh, I, I'm a part of a number of families, and uh, this is one of them. It's it's mm. good to be a part of the EMS Leadership Academy family. Uh, good to continue to see what we can do to help the pre-hospital healthcare system be a better place, not only better for the people who receive care, but for people who give it. And that is it. That's that's we're going to wrap this conversation up, and look forward to seeing many of you and speaking with many of you at our next opportunity. So uh, until next time, that's this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. We'll see you later. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. To stay up to date with the best content on workplace mental health in America, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and join the Flourish DX community at www.flourishdx.com.